Hey, what's up, friend? I'm about to drop some some dimes. I want to give you some education about how I typically finance my deals. Now, don't get me wrong. There's many ways to skin a cat, as you're aware of, right? There's more than one tool that you can apply to be able to creatively finance your deals, so that way you can continue to get cash flow. So I'm gonna share with you just a few on this video, okay? And I'm gonna share with you some math. So this is the math I typically do when I'm um, buying a property, okay? So let's talk about the first thing that I normally do. I normally get a mortgage, all right? So that's, that's, that's a beauty, beautiful thing to use. Why? Because with a mortgage for investment properties, and by the way, I'm only talking about investment properties, not personal residences. But for investment properties, a mortgage lender will typically give you 80% of the money that's needed to buy the property. More or less, it fluctuates sometimes based upon the lender's criteria or the market that we're in. But at the time it's recording and the lenders that I've invested with, 80%. So I mean, if I'm buying a five unit for 100K, the mortgage company's covering $80,000, okay? Now, the next thing I like to do is negotiate seller financing in which I want the seller to cover up to 10% of the purchase price. So if I'm buying a five unit for 100K, the mortgage covers 80,000 and the seller will cover 10,000. So that means I have $10,000 left that I need to come up with the money to buy the property. Excuse my uh, my grammar, my diction. <laughs> I know that was a little off, but we'll make it work. Now, you might be thinking, well, why won't the seller do 20% or do even higher? Well, if you're buying a property with a mortgage, the mortgage company will cap how much the seller can contribute towards uh, the loan. This is the second mortgage, okay, towards buying the property. So there's a limit, okay? And the seller who's providing seller financing can actually take a second uh, lien if that mortgage isn't paid. So the mortgage company has the first lien position and the seller for the seller finance will have a second lien position, okay? So that's 90% of the financing right there, okay? And you're wondering, well, how, how you negotiate that? You know, how can you get a seller to agree that? That's another story, that's another video for another day, okay? So just to stick with the math for now. I'm just showing you the structure, 90% covered. Now keep in mind, this strategy that I'm sharing with you is only applicable to five units and up. So it has to be a commercial mortgage. Okay, not a personal mortgage, not an investment mortgage for residential properties. Residential properties for in the mortgage world is anything from one unit, which is a single family, in other words, up to four. So the strategies I'm sharing with you right now, five units and up, okay? Commercial mortgages are open to seller financing, not residential. You can't go to a residential mortgage lender in which you're buying a three unit and ask to do Ask the seller to do a 10% seller financing. It just won't fly. All right. So let's get back to the math. So we're at 90% so far. Now the latter 10%, or let me say 20%, could come from uh, various ways. Now, why do I say 20%? Because if you do the math, if you add up 80% plus for the mortgage, plus 10% from the seller, that's 90%. And if you add another 20%, that's 110% financing. Why 110%? Because you have to account for the following. The down payment, which is 10%, plus you want to have an additional 10%, so that's the 20% I talked about, to cover reserves, soft costs, and closing costs. Because when you close, you want to pay the agent, the mortgage lender, the real estate attorney, all those people got to get paid, right, at closing, so there's closing costs. Plus, soft costs, those are costs you incur before you close, such as when you close on a property, you got to pay for property inspections, you might want to form an entity. So these are additional expenses. And in addition, it's also prudent and wise to have reserves. So just in case you close, you got some money in the bank. So if the toilet goes out or a tenant moves out, you got money to cover it. So you want to have reserves. That's just being smart. Okay, so that's why you want to have 20%. Now, there are many different vehicles in which you can get that 20% from, but I'm only going to name a few, not all of them. Okay, because I want to keep this, this video short and sweet under five minutes. So you can also use business credit, business funding, because if you're starting out and you're trying to get money through partners or through private money, you know, limited partners or people giving you um, a promissory note for a loan, it can be challenging in the beginning because you don't have that proven track record established. And so many private money lenders or private equity partners, they may be hesitant to give you their hard earned money if you're inexperienced, that's just how it is. Now you might have the gift of gab, you might have a great relationship with them, you may be great with sales and negotiations, so if you if you have that talent and skill set, then by all means use it, raise the capital. But if not, 
like I was when I first started out, I had to use what I, what I can get, which was business credit, in which I used the business credit to cover that latter 20%. So that way I can buy a property 100% finance, not just any property, but a cash flowing multifamily property. So if you're interested in, in acquiring cash flowing rental properties as well, multifamily baby, then I have a free training for you that shows you the ins and outs of how to go about doing it. Just check the link below to learn more in the description. As always, guys, it's to your success. Continue to earn passively, live passionately. Peace.